Hi, welcome to James Miller Lifeology. We learn to simplify and transform your spirit, mind, and body. My name is James Miller. I'm a licensed psychotherapist and a composer. Thank you so much for joining with us today. Let's get started. Did you know that on jamesmillerlifeology.com, you can enroll in the academy I created for listeners just like you? I've created courses you may take at your own pace, which will help you simplify and transform your spirit, mind, and body. Enroll in one of the classes today. I have a great show for you today. I'm going to help you repurpose your life. I'll also be interviewing career coach Mark Miller, who reviews his book, Repurpose Your Career, A Practical Guide for the Second Half of Life. This is a phenomenal book, which gives you real-life strategies and techniques to revamp your life. You all know me as a psychotherapist, but some of you may not yet know me as a composer. I currently have two albums which have been released. Think of both albums like books. Each composition is written like a chapter in a book. The first album, Consolation, explores a character's grief and loss. And just like in any book, the story explores a character's heartache and eventually he finds healing and hope. The second album, Restoration, explores a character's personal development. He has an awakening, and in that awakening, he recognizes all the things in his life which aren't healthy, and it helps him come to a place of restoration, being restored to something greater than before. You may purchase both albums on iTunes or any other digital music store. The names of the albums are Consolation and Restoration, and my stage name is James S. Miller. The name of the piece you're currently hearing is from the second album, Restoration, entitled Determination. Repurposing your life. As we grow up, we try many different types of things to determine the path we're going to take. Some of us as children know exactly what we'd like to be when we grow up, while others take their time figuring that out. Sometimes situations just fall into our lap where we all of a sudden realize this is the person I want to be or this is the career path that I want to take. But what we often don't realize is our personality and interests are going to change. Think about it. When you were in high school, you are probably not the same type of person you are today. The interest that you had when you were younger probably evolved over time, and pretty soon what you thought you originally wanted to be as you grew up is probably not the same thing. It's a really good reframe to look at it in that respect, because think about yourself maybe five years ago. That person five years ago is really not the same person I'm speaking with today. So why would we often think that the career choices or even the interests and hobbies that we have would always stay the same? There's absolutely nothing wrong with staying in the same career, But if you find yourself asking the question, there's got to be more, or you simply say, I cannot imagine myself doing this another day, then there needs to be a repurposing or retooling of who you are. I know many people who say, James, I have 15 more years in this organization, and then I'll get my pension. And that makes perfect sense because they understand that they have security there. But what we also have to keep in mind is quality of life. If you struggle every day to go to your job and it causes you so much frustration and anxiety that you just you find yourself experiencing symptoms of depression, there needs to be a reframe of your life. There's nothing wrong with staying with the same organization, but it is important for you to say, if this is not serving me anymore, what do I do about it? My guest today, Mark Miller, is going to be talking specifically about that. He's going to help people repurpose and retool their life as they get older. But I wanted to have a little bit of a prequel in the sense of helping you understand that asking yourself the question right this second, am I happy when I think about my life? Are there parts of my life that need to be revisited or maybe just even revamped? And if that's the case, it is really important for you to say, what's my life going to be like? How would I want my life to be like? Sometimes we often have fear in the sense of, I'm too old, and there's no way I can start something over, or we often think that it's too late for you. But it is not too late for you at all. There's so many amazing options out there for you. A few years ago, I heard of a 90-year-old woman who had a dream to complete university. And at 91 years old, she graduated with her Bachelor of Arts degree. And I think that is absolutely wonderful. It's an amazing, inspirational story for each one of us, because you're never too old to make a change. You're never too old to determine your success. There is always a purpose for you. You get to determine what that's going to be. A quick example of one of the courses you'll find in the Academy entitled Spirit, Mind, Body, The Perfect Triad. This non-religious course helps you understand how your intuition, or rather your gut, your logic, and your body all work together to help you overcome any obstacle you may face. Enroll in the class today. Mark Miller is a founder of Career Pivot, 
a career design firm that helps those in the second half of life take incremental steps to a new and fulfilling career. He is here to talk with us today about his new book, Repurpose Your Career, A Practical Guide for the Second Half of Life. Welcome to my show, Mark. Well, it's great to be here. Well, you know, you have a wonderful last name, so you must be a very <laughs> fascinating person. So clearly we'll have a chance to, to talk about all that. <laughs> but your book today, uh, Repurpose Your Career, A Practical Guide for the Second Half of Life, I think is very, very relevant, not only in my psychology practice that I have, but also just in a lot of people I know. They've, they've really struggled with kind of figuring out what their life looks like. You know, we have, may have planned it a certain way. And then as their life goes on, they realize, wait a minute, I'm not being fulfilled. So I'm really interested in hearing how this book came about and people have a you know, better understanding of who you are and just will really be able to talk about the, the, the meat of this book. Sure. Uh, my story is relatively simple. I was uh, raised in New Jersey, went to college in Chicago, and I joke I was, uh, I was raised to be an employee to go work for a father-like company that would take care of me. Mm. And so when I graduated from college, I went to work for the Borg. I mean, IBM. <laughs> and I spent... I spent 22 years wandering around IBM, uh -huh. uh, all in Austin, Texas, uh, until they screwed me on my pension in 1999, and I said goodbye and went to work for a successful tech startup, Agira. Oh, okay. Uh, and then on July 11th of 2002, I'm a big-time cyclist. I came down a hill at about 25 miles an hour, uh, turned into a blind turn, and fortunately, there was a Toyota Corolla going oh, my gosh. direction. So I... Um, I I spent five days in a trauma center. Uh, I tore up a knee. I broke a hit, hip. I dislocated a shoulder, broke a bunch of ribs, broke the clavicle. But I had no internal injuries and no brain injuries I'm willing to admit to. <laughs> and they had me walking on crutches in three days. I was back on a bike in 10 weeks, flying back to China in four months. Oh, my gosh. And it's what, what I refer to as my WTF moment. Uh, why am I doing this? Yeah. We weren't rich, but we were debt-free at that point. And I was 46. My kid was off to college. So I went off and teach high school math. I laid myself off the following year. Hmm. I was very successful. I did that for two years. I couldn't do that and stay healthy. So... I went off and did some nonprofit work. I joke I went to the Jewish Community Center and did, built a corporate development program for them. The problem is I'm not Jewish. Uh -huh. So being, being a non-Jew, being the face of a Jewish organization is uh, interesting. Yes, that would be interesting. At least that's very interesting. <laughs> um, when I left that, I, went, I, I joke I relapsed. I went back into a startup. And so I wrote out both the recessions at mm -hmm. successful tech startups my, uh, while most of my friends were being wiped out. And I'm, I've been a perpetual job changer and career changer. I'm on my seventh career. Oh, wow. So I joke now I'm a recovering engineer. There's, 12, there's a 12-step 12 program for that. And, and so I kind of built systems to say, okay, how did I do that? And that's kind of the, where the book came from, the processes I use, because I, I watch so many of my colleagues going, okay, what do I do now? The world has changed. And by the way, it's not going back. Mm -hmm. And it all starts out with know thyself, which is one of the challenges. As I said, I was raised to be employee. I wasn't raised to say, cut. I'm going to go to work and have fun. No, I'm going to go work to go make money so I can pay the mortgage, put my mm -hmm. kids through college, put food on the table. So there's a formula that was always instilled in everybody. The, you do X, Y, and Z, and therefore you will have this, this, and this, and that is what is expected of you. That's right. Mm -hmm. And we were expected to go to work. And after 30, 40 years, we could retire. And then, oh, by the way, that's when fun starts. Well, they moved our cheese. And, and so it's, it's coming up with saying, okay, most of us, retirement is not going to look like what our parents retired to. We're mm -hmm. going to live a lot longer. I don't have any plan to ever quit working. I want to work less on my terms at something I love. Yeah. Well, I think you said something that was really relevant earlier as well. I mean, everything, of course, everything you said was relevant, but you said, know thyself. Let's talk this, about the specifics of know thyself, because that, I think, in theory, that's, that makes a lot of sense. But what, what, is you, what do you typically mean by that when you're working with maybe your clients or just even in this book, knowing thyself? What does that mean? Sure. To you? 
Uh, it, it's, there are a couple different ways that you, I can, we work on this. Mm -hmm. One is I use the Berkman assessment, which I just adore. And I will find how people have changed their behaviors. So I'm a class example. I'm a closet introvert. Mm -hmm. I'm actually pretty shy, but I'm a phenomenally good public speaker. I can work a networking event with the best. Mm -hmm. I became an extrovert or I started behaving like an extrovert because I made more money that way. Ah, so it was a need that, w that you had to fulfill in order to become more successful. Yeah. And we start to convince ourselves, I'm an extrovert, which the reality is I am not. I walk off a stage, I, my knees buckle. Mm. I'm tired. You know, I go to a networking event or I, you know, I was a sponsor for a conference last weekend. You know, I was, I was on all day at five o'clock. I walked out of there. I went home and took a nap. <laughs> Sounds like something I would do. <laughs> I, yeah. I have to know that about myself. Um, I, I have a couple of clients who are what I call structured anarchists. Um, they're very orderly. They look, you know, they, every piece of clothes on them is is, is in place. Meticulous. They, sure. they love rules. The problem is the rules have to be theirs. You would never know it, but where they're at their best is walking into, into chaos and creating order. Hmm. And what everyone assumes is, wow, you're so orderly. You'd be great at running this. And what happens is they go, okay. And then a year later, they're miserable. Ah, that's, that's, I think that's really interesting. The, uh, because I think that that's a really good point. A lot of us think it's something, and then we, we, we act as if for so long that we think that really is part of us, but it's really not. And I, I think that's one of the most important factors that, you know, if, if you don't have that self-awareness at time of self-reflection, you will fall into that trap. And that's probably the next part where then you realize, I don't want to do this anymore. And that's when people start to re-question this, re-question their life, re-question their purpose. And then all of a sudden they're like, what's next? Why? Am yeah. I and, per and, and particularly when there's pushback and you're saying, I don't want to do this anymore. Oh, but you're so good at it. Mm -hmm. You make so much money at it. Why wouldn't you want to do it? And the answer is, I'm sick of it. Yeah. Being good at something doesn't mean you enjoy it. And that's a really good point, you know, to separate between those two things. I think it goes back also to the metric of success. Our version of what success is, there's, there's going back to the formula we discussed, the formula of you maybe go to university, you work at a, at, a, um, at a company for so many years, and all of a sudden you're successful. And a lot of that has to do with either your job title, but also the financial compensation as well, so therefore to be able to do these other things. But I think learning how to redefine the metric of success, regardless if you're good at something or not, does not mean that that is what your life's passion should be about. Yeah, it, rather interesting. I, I, I have a number of clients right now who are what I refer to as closet creatives. Mm -hmm. And that is they're very artistic. They're maybe very musical, very creative, and they've taken that and shoved it to go to work and make money. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, they have to do that stuff because it makes them happy. Yeah, that's very true. And so you kind of have to figure out, okay, these are what I refer to often as restorative niches. By the way, that term comes from Susan Cain's book on, on uh, introversion, Quiet. Okay. And that is inserting things into your day that restore you. I like that. Right? Yeah. Because you don't always, at work, you don't always get what you want. You know, it's, it's interesting to say this. I may not be yet at that demographic as far as the age, but that's for something for me. You know, my practice back in D.C., I um, will often, you know, if I have, I go up there once a month to see patients for um, just for a couple of days. And sometimes I'll have, you know, 12, 13 clients in a row. And I, I love to read. So I always take my, my, uh, my electronic reader and I go up there and I know that I have 10 minutes in between a session. I have to do X, Y, and Z. I literally make myself read, if, even if it's just for a minute, to read something because that is how I reframe it and how I bring myself back to my center. And then it's like I close that book. It means I close also the chapter from the previous patient and I go into the next one. So I, I truly believe and agree wholeheartedly with you that figuring out what you have to do during the day to reset yourself minute by minute, moment by moment, hour by hour is going to help you be much more successful. Now, switching gears here a little bit, because I definitely want to get into the meat of this book as well. You know, looking at the whole aspects of, because it's, it's kind of tailored a lot towards the baby boomers, if you will. But I think in anyone, it's, it's an audible book, or audible as far as the message is audible, that 
people can learn how to maybe reformat their life and start over and start a different career, pivot their career, if you will, um, to be able to find something that is specifically for them. One thing I really wanted to ask you is the self-esteem component. You know, if people are in their job and let's say they are doing really well, or let's say they're in this career and they're not excited about it and they just don't feel fulfilled, to go from a modicum of success, you know, let's say you're a mid-manager or maybe even the, man- or the, you know, the, the director of something, but to all of a sudden say, well, I'm going to switch my career and then to all of a sudden go f- as the novice or the amateur of something when you're an expert in a career, how, how does that affect them? I mean, I can only imagine based off of, you know, my background, but, you know, for you work with these particular individuals all the time, how does it affect their self-esteem to go from the expert now to the novice or the amateur when they know they want to start something over? You have to remember, we don't make this these as big leaps Mm -hmm. that's why we came up with the term pivot okay that makes sense it's it's multiple steps challenge is if you're in your 50s 40 50 60 you got to maintain your income Mm -hmm. so therefore do i make these big huge leaps the answer is no you make them incrementally so i'll use the example my intern who's a 50 something year old woman (laughs) uh she started out in Number one, she was, uh, she, she was doing uh, air and water permitting in, for an environmental engineering firm for 20-plus years and got sick of it. At that same company, she eventually moved into a business development and more of a marketing role. And now she's left that and moved into a pure marketing role mm. in a, in a mining, co- mining equipment company. Uh, I like to see, she says now says, if you got big rocks in your yard, I can help you. I got rock crusher. Uh, but it's, <laughs> been, it's been an incremental process. Now there's no question. There are at times that you just kind of have to take it and suck it up and mm-hmm. learn to ask and ask for sure. help. Uh, I'll joke. Uh, I went, when I went off to teach high school math, I you know, I've been teaching adults for 20 years. I've done it in 40 different countries, but wow. I got, I got into an inner city high school and I was dealing with a new culture, a culture of poverty. Mm-hmm. And I was teaching algebra two. I had a great algebra one mentor, but I was struggling. So I found this young lady across the hallway for me who was 27. I was old enough to be her father. And I finally went to Jana and said, can I have your lesson plans? <laughs> and what I did was for the rest of the year, was I stayed two days behind her. So I, every Friday, I'd pick her next week's lesson plans up, and which I would then start teaching on, two, on Wednesday. And if I didn't understand, I could go watch her. Mm. Oh, okay. Right? And there were a couple of times where I looked at the lesson plans, and I'd go, you know what? I didn't get this. And it was, it was me sucking it up, saying, I'm not the expert anymore. And I also have to understand why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. What's the real underlying reason I'm doing this? And, and it's not, it it certainly wasn't for the money and it wasn't for the prestige. It was to help the kids. Mm Mm-hmm. And which if I can stop you for one second, because it goes back to that metric of success Your success was helping helping the, the kids learn math. Their success was being able to impart and instill in them something that you enjoyed versus the, the accolades or, you know, the finances, et cetera. So I think it really goes back to knowing yourself as far as what makes you resonate as opposed yeah. to what's expected of you. Yeah. One of the problems there was, is I kind of expected to go in to teach math. Mm-hmm. And really what I went into there was teaching life skills. Mm. I adapted. But what I, what I walked into was not what I expected. Mm-hmm. As you go off and do something new, you have to be able to say, as I go through this process, I'm going to spend a lot of time listening. Oh, that's how you learn. That's really how you right. learn is when you, when you perceive, when you watch, when you listen, when you observe. Yeah. It, it's, I have a chapter in my new book on MSU syndrome mm-hmm. called Make Stuff Up. <laughs> when, when, when we... When we don't know something and there's a void, we tend to fill it with stuff we make up. And one of the challenges is when you're walking into a new environment, don't make assumptions, do your homework, and don't make stuff up as best you can. So it's going in with, it with an intentionality of being open as opposed to going in as an expert we talked 
about before who may have had a preconceived idea based off of your previous life or previous skill set. And so if you go in with that, well, then you're not there to learn. You're there to, you're there as the yeah. expert all of a sudden. And that's not your role. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'll use the example. I went into the school district and I said, simple things like I'm going to take the school district's health insurance. And then when I got the paperwork and I found out that the, to insure my son, my wife and myself was going to be double my current Cobra payment. Oh goodness. Wow. And then I later find out that nobody uses their, the school health insurance policies to insure their kids or their spouses. Nobody does, but I didn't think to ask. Sure. Well, you don't know Simple. what you don't know, of course. That's right. Well, I also assumed, because I was an engineer and I'd been teaching adults for 20 years, school districts, and they had a math teacher shortage, that they wouldn't want me to teach math. Mm. No, they didn't. They didn't want any guy over 40. We don't oh. do what we're told. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> for many reasons, they want very compliant people. And, oh. and for, some, for some reasons, it's you know, because sure. things are driven legislatively and that you have to follow the rules. I just assume I made stuff up and in it. And part of the process is learning not to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, going, trying stuff. I had one client who thought he wanted to go be a butcher. He actually was a project manager for technology company. Oh, that's and he, very different. And, <laughs> and he took some, he, he was off a retirement package. He went and, and took some, uh, animal husbandry classes at the uh, local community college. The smart thing was. He got a seasonal job at Whole Foods in mm. the meat department. And what he discovered was he couldn't be on his feet that much. Ah. He physically couldn't handle it. Well, that was, that was a very valuable lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, you know, most of these are not that, you don't make these huge radical shifts, but you got, but you got to be willing to go try stuff. Yeah. Well, you use the analogy of, of basketball in, in the description of your book as well, as when you're, when you're going to throw the ball, you know, obviously you can't pick up your feet because you're traveling, but you so one foot's on the ground, you're pivoting around to find your teammates, which is just your, kind of your interest in life. And that really helps you say, well, which direction am I supposed to go? Who's open? Which, how do I go forward with this? And then that's obviously what you mean as far as the pivoting component of that. And you move around until you see what makes sense, and then you make your next step. And then you move around just like your friend who went from um, – she was changed, changed her job around, but she slowly made those changes of what she liked. She pivoted to that next part of whatever it was she discovered, and then to the next thing. And pretty soon, she was able to really find a, a different trajectory of where her new career, new path was going to lead her. But she didn't do it without linking all those things together. Yeah, I commonly say every one of my career changes has been a half-step career change. And what I mean by that is I always had one foot in the old world. I had one foot in the new world. And there was always a relationship that took me across. Mm. Oh. In other words, I never did it alone. So there's an interpersonal aspect that goes along with it, whether that's someone encouraging you, whether that's you sitting there talking with someone like your coworker who was a math instructor, you, you had that interactions with people so that they were almost, I don't say a mentor, but they were there to help you and answer some questions and maybe give you some insight that you didn't know. Because once again, you don't know what you don't know unless you ask. That's right. And, and more importantly, when you are making these changes, someone has to trust you that you're going to be able to make, make the leap. Mm. And that's why very often making the initial change is very often best at the, your existing company. Oh, okay. Well, I think that's a really relevant point for people to really, my listeners to really grasp and hold on to. Yeah. It's and and it's not, it's, a, it's not making these big leaps. It's more making these incremental changes mm. because number one, you can maintain your income, but two, um, it's, People know you, they trust you. Uh, in the, in, again, in, in my book, I have a chapter on weak ties mm -hmm. and, and weak ties is a concept that came out of, um, uh, Stanford university in the 1970s. I, I learned about it in Adam Grant's book, give and take. And it's the concept is those people who don't know you really well, people who you worked with 10, 15 years ago are actually more valuable to you than the people who know you really well because they know people you don't know. Ah, okay. Oh, that, that makes sense. So a classic example of this is something like your children's 
friend's parents. They know that they may have a completely different network than you. Yeah. Or when I went to teach high school math, my most valuable uh, connector was my chiropractor. Hmm. She knows, she knows people I don't know. Yeah. So it's almost like your cir- your, where the circles collide or connect in some way, those circles then of networking, if you will, then leads to other things. It's almost like that six degrees of separation. <laughs> yes, yes. In some ways, everybody knows somebody who's going to be able to help you. But if you only stay within your certain circle, you're not really going to be expansive and maybe have those opportunities that you would have should you be a different version or have a different style of networking. Yeah, it's, and the reality is these people already know you. You already know them, so even the most introverted person can typically reach out to. It's more comfortable to go mm-hmm. ask for help because you've already known them uh, at some point in the past. And, and the reality is you need help. You need to go ask for help. That much very true. And and I'm sorry, I'm a guy. I don't like asking for directions. <laughs> That's funny. Unfortunately, we only have a, just a couple more seconds to talk, but I wanted to ask you one thing. What What is, how do you really instill hope for those people who are saying, I really want to make a change? What, what is that encouraging word or advice you can give my listeners who want to make this change? Um, of course, I want them to read your book because I think it's a phenomenal book for them specifically. But what do you really tell them to say, it's okay to make this change? What, what, what would be the advice you would give for people in this situation? Is, is to go back and look at your past and when have you been the happiest and why? Mm. I mean, it's, it, in, and, and the idea is, is to go look for that and understand, as I said, Understand what makes you happy, what makes you feel valued, and start looking for that. Very often, we are, we are at our best when we are in the right environment, mm-hmm. and it's more important who we work with in the environment than what we do. I really like that. that I think that's, right? that's very true, yeah, because we're, not only that, because we're part of a, we're just societal creatures. It doesn't necessarily mean introvert and extrovert are part of it, but to be a part of something that has meaning or has value or that, you, whether it's just on a daily basis of interacting with people itself, that's then how you can internalize that and externalize that to what, that which what you do in your field. Yeah, and so that's where you start looking. Mm-hmm. And... And, and so you, it's, it's kind of like you seek out kindred spirits and the more you understand what you're looking for, the more you can articulate it, the more likely people will be able to help you. It's great advice. Right. If, if someone says, well, what are you looking for? Well, I really don't know. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know how to help you. Yeah. But if you can be clear and in a lot of, if you've been working for 30 and 40 years, there's a lot of stuff in the past that you can go look at and, you know, both when have you been the happiest and when have you been the most miserable and why? Yeah, that's well, exactly. We have so much data in our life, in our past yes. that gives us and there's so many answers that we just don't realize until we stop and reflect on that. Wonderful advice. Well, Mark Miller, thank you so much for being a guest on my show today. Your book, Repurpose Your Career, A Practical Guide for the Second Half of Life. Where may my listeners find this book? Uh, it should be available starting on March 15th on, um, on Amazon. It should, the idea is we're going to pre-order starting on March 15th and should be available uh, on April 15th in honor of, ta- on honor of American Tax Day. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's why I like that. <laughs> that's hysterical. So what I'm going to do, Mark, is I'm also going to put it on my, in the storefront of James Miller Lifeology. So people can obviously find it on Amazon, or they can go to jamesmillerlifeology.com, and they can see that in the storefront there, which will link them to Amazon. Cool. And on your website itself, where may they find out more information about you? Sure. You can go to careerpivot.com. And if you want to reach out to me, I'm Mark. It's M-A-R-C, my mama knew how to spell, (laughs) at careerpivot.com. Wonderful. Mark, once again, thank you so much for being a guest on my show today. I really appreciated your practical wisdom and insight for all my listeners today. Well, it's been great talking with you. I also want to thank you, my listener, for joining with me today. Please subscribe to this radio show through whichever portal you joined with me. Also, please go to my website where you may sign up for my newsletter, enroll in the Lifeology Academy, watch my YouTube episodes, and read all the articles I've written just for you. If you'd like to become a guest or advertise on my show, simply visit jamesmillerlifeology.com. 
You may also follow me on all social media platforms under the name James Miller Lifeology, except for Twitter, which is James M. Lifeology. Have a fantastic day, and I look forward to speaking with you very soon.